liberalism before we go into decline or, or what? So what is liberalism to you? Um, liberalism is not the American definition of being on the left. Liberalism in the classical sense uh, means uh, a society with checks and balances where power is dispersed to independent institutions, independent judiciary, civil society, that then can become democratic, but democratic usually in sequencing in history comes after liberal institutions, usually liberal institutions have been built. And the famous phrase by de Tocqueville, the great chronicler of America in the 19th century, the French, um, was that the American system is designed to prevent the tyranny of the majority. So it means that even if you're in a minority, you have absolute certain rights and protections under a system, a liberal institutional system, that usually goes with um, democracy. I mean, I can, go, I can go on for a very, I can disappear down a rabbit hole for a very long time, and I'd like Mukul to have a chance to join me in this rabbit hole. It's a big, it's a big question. Yes, it is a big question. Um, I think where we are currently across the world is that liberalism tends to be a residual category. Uh, as uh, Ed pointed out, classically it means the one thing, but effectively what has happened today, whether you look at America or, or, or Britain or Sri Lanka or the Philippines or India, is that liberalism seems to be what's left over after your right-wing enemy is subtracted, if indeed you think the right-wing is the enemy. So it could mean people on the left, it could mean people on the liberal left, whatever that means, people who are liberals. Essentially, it's a, it's a kind of beleaguered flag which is flown in the face of what seems to be, um, you can call it a resurgent populism or a nationalism or a majoritarianism that seems to have infected most parts of the world. So is there a tension between liberalism and democracy? I mean, should people in California get more votes than people in... Ohio, I mean, sure, in the morning, sure. I, I was sort of a little uncomfortable with stuff you said about Michigan and this, that. I mean, it, to me, it's, is, it, is, is, is there a tension between representative democracy, one person, one vote, and liberalism? Uh, sure, there is. And, you know, since we've had the Ayodhya court ruling this morning, let's just use that as a data point. Um, clearly, the BJP is the majority party. 38% um, of the vote in a country like India is, is a majority. Um, and uh, so democracy is being expressed through the Modi government. This is the popular will. Um, but the independence of institutions, including the courts, are becoming gradually um, less robust as time goes on. And they're no real match for an organized majoritarian movement such as the one Modi, um, Modi is leading. So you get to a situation, I, I think in India, that you've already got, say, in Hungary, where the president of Hungary, Viktor Orban, describes Hungary as an illiberal democracy. And what does he mean by that? Well, they still have elections, but he and his cronies own the whole media. The courts are completely in their pockets. There are no separate centers of power challenging his grip on democracy. So when an election happens, sure, you don't need to rig it. It's not, a level, it's not a level playing field. And I, my fear is India is moving towards becoming an illiberal democracy. Is there a tension? Uh, yeah, about the question of where there's a tension between uh, liberalism and democracy, I won't repeat what uh, Ed has said. I'll, I'll simply say that uh, I think we should distinguish between, uh, say, the Smithian idea of a political majority and the ideological imperatives of what is sometimes described by that ugly word, majoritarianism. I mean, the, the giveaway is that there's an ism at the end of it. And the argument of uh, majoritarians all over the world is that the political destinies of a nation should be controlled by its cultural majority. I think the tension between the liberal notion of a political majority and the majoritarian notion of the idea of political hegemony based upon a predetermined cultural majority. It could be Hindus in India, it could be uh, white nationalists uh, in the US, it could be white left behinds in England, it could be uh, Buddhists in Sri Lanka. Uh, the Sri Lankans actually amended their constitution in the early 1970s to actually say Buddhism has the foremost place. 
So I think the tension is not about whether liberals are against majorities. That would be foolish. Uh, you can't have a liberal democracy without democracy. Uh, the strain is when majorities within a political system uh, present you with a dominant majority that sees itself as the exclusive arbiter of that nation's majority. That this is not a bunch of, this is not a majority made up of, uh, of if you will, uh, individuals of various kinds acting in unknowing concert. That this is in fact, uh, as old fashioned lefties would say, a kind of overdetermined majority, a majority based upon, upon faith or race or culture. So when we, when we say there's a decline of, was there some golden age of liberalism? I mean, is, is sort of amnesia, nostalgia usually sort of amnesia? I mean, was there liberalism? I mean, some women in Switzerland got to vote in 72. We know 60s for, you know, other kinds of minority race in the US. So, so when you say we're declining, we're declining relative to what? The ideal? Um, look, there wasn't a golden age. There was like, there was like a platinum age, uh, maybe a silver age. Um, Today is the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and as a student, I was lucky enough uh, studying in England, but we heard about it in time. We took a ferry, rented a car on the other side of the channel from Zeebrugge, drove to Berlin at about 100 miles an hour. There's no speed limit in Germany. Got there and we participated in this vandalism of the wall. An extraordinary moment, which I feel, feel deeply privileged to have witnessed. And that was kind of a peak, because at that moment, as you remember, Francis Fukuyama had written his very famous end of history, meaning that we'd arrived at the ideological end point where there was no longer any argument about the best kind of political system, liberal democracy, that all, all countries should go towards. So whether that was platinum or silver, nothing is golden. You're quite right. Nothing's ever golden except in retrospect, where we edit our memories. But today is, I don't know how many metals we have to go down the chain. Today is sort of brass. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what the best analogy would be. Liberal democracy is in mortal trouble. Don't, we, and we shouldn't understate the degree to which it is in mortal trouble. Um, in the West, we tend to talk about Western democracies um, and therefore exclude India, which is, of course, the largest democracy in the world. But I think if you incorporate India, some of the other democracies, the Philippines, a country I was based in for two years, um, the United States, um, Britain, there is a retreat. I prefer the word retreat to decline. And the book I wrote was about the retreat of Western liberalism. Um, there is a retreat going on, which implies we could regroup. The argument isn't over. In the long run, we're all dead, etc. But for the time being, um, there is a serious ideological battle going on for the future of our politics. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't mince words on that. It, it, it's a very, very serious moment that we're living through. What, what do you think? Is it I just want to pick up on, uh, on something that, uh, that Ed said. Uh, he spoke about how we, uh, not we, but uh, in the context of the global media, the conversation is about uh, liberal majorities uh, in the West. It's, it's about uh, the decline of liberalism in the West. And as he pointed out, India is certainly the largest democracy there is in the world. And I think it might be actually useful to use the Indian case to try and think about what has happened to liberalism and liberal democracy the world over. Because in some ways, we've anticipated in a clearer, more robust way, not necessarily a good way, uh, we found terms uh, to actually describe what is happening. Because I think one of the terms that I find uh, sort of problematic is this notion of populism. In your previous conversation today with, uh, with Keshava, you said that uh, the meeting between Elizabeth Warren, uh, the prospective meeting uh, competition between uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Trump would be a competition between two populisms. I have to say I disagree. It seems to be an equivalence that can't actually be maintained because if you think of uh, this policy wonk, which is what Elizabeth Warren is, uh, while she might tend radically left in the context of the American mainstream, there's no real uh, idiomatic or personality sense in which you get the sense that she's a populist like Trump is. So uh, this division between left populism and right populism, 
I think is in some ways misleading. I would actually advocate that whether we are looking at Trump's America or whether we are looking at Duterte's Philippines, the appropriate term isn't in fact populism. Because populism is not a word that uh, accounts for, for power or weight or asymmetry. What we are looking at is majoritarianism. You can call it nationalism. You can call it majoritarian nationalism. You could argue that uh, Trump represents, if you will, a form of white nationalism. Now, there have been many disagreements about this, and people have argued that there are good, and Ed argues this eloquently in his book, that there's a kind of long-term decline of Western manufacturing thanks to globalization, and that this is going to be a long-term decline, and so this is, problem is going to be with us for a long time now. There's a kind of economic underlying reason for the way in which American voters in the heartlands vote they, the, way they, uh, the way they vote. But I would argue that you know, if you look at the majorities that the Republican Party has built for at least 50 years, it's built, built, built it through dog whistling, through, in many cases, explicit racism. And this has been a long time coming. To argue that there's some sense in which the Rust Belt flipping is, and you could argue that the Rust Belt flipped for reasons of class rather than race, but it's an inadequate story simply because uh, this has been built over time. Uh, you know, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush Jr. used to dog whistle. And in a sense, uh, what, we, what we actually have is, is a cultivated majoritarianism in America, like India, uh, perhaps done without the same kind of, uh, of cadres and long-term imagination that the Sangh Parivar has demonstrated. But it is a majoritarianism nonetheless. I mean, Duterte's uh, nationalism or populism is fueled by uh, various sorts of minoritarian enemies. Rajapakshi in Sri Lanka uh, first went after the Tamils, and after the Tamils had been pulverized, he now wants to go after Sri Lankan Muslims. At our doorstep, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, Burma is essentially predicated on a kind of anti-Muslimism. It's not even an anti-minoritarianism. And I would argue that we are in exactly that same place, except that we have arrived at it in a kind of, in a kind of concerted way. And I think today's judgment, uh, along with other things that uh, are imminent, for example, the notion of the National Register of Citizens becoming uh, a, a, a national phenomenon instead of uh, something uh, restricted to Assam, uh, the appalling citizenship amendment bill, which would essentially uh, introduce a religious test for citizenship. This is how majoritarianism works. In fact, what is interesting about uh, the Ram Jan Janbhumi judgment is that 15 or 20 years ago, it would have seemed apocalyptic because it was seen as symbolic of the Sangh Parivar's need to demonstrate that minorities and Muslims should defer to the Hindu majority. But it was a symbolic demonstration. Now we are at a stage where the state actually creates a structure by which it certifies citizenship and creates a political circumstance where you could actually nominate as, shall we say, second class or false citizens, entire category of people. So do you want to respond to that? Or, I mean, is the decline of liberalism in the, in the West populism or is it economic? I mean, is the rise of Trump race and religion or is it economic? It, it's a mix. It's not, it's not one or the other. There is a sort of huge, rather stale debate in America between people who say it's all cultural euphemism for race, mm -hmm. cultural anxiety um, of a white majority that fears it's going to become a minority, and then the other side of the debate that it's all to do with the collapse of middle class standard of living. Clearly, it's both, um, and so it's not one or the other. On the populism point, look, um, I don't want to get too caught up on a definition of a term, on the semantics of one particular word. But in 2016, Donald Trump won West Virginia by more than any other state, except, I think, Wyoming. It was 70-30. He got about 70%. Hillary Clinton got about 30%. There was an exit poll done um, on, the, on voting day. Um, which showed if Bernie Sanders had been the Democratic candidate, he would have beaten Trump in West Virginia by 48% to 46%. Left populists, or for want of a better term, left anti-plutocratic politics, as opposed to right Pluto-populist politics, aims for the same votes. 
They're fishing for the same votes. They're fishing for people who think that the system is broken, that it is rigged, and that's a term that Elizabeth Warren uses. The system is rigged, it's broken, um, and that it is, a politics as normal is dead. And they're fishing for the same vote. So I don't want to get too caught up in the definition of one word, but I do think that you would, you would genuinely in 2020, if Elizabeth Warren were the nominee, have two very, very radical candidates for the first time in American history. There's, there, will, there, will, there will never be an election where the crossroads of going one way versus the other is so radically different than between Warren and Trump. I can't think of an election that would even begin to compare to that. But why, why do you, why, isn't that a human disease of presentism? We think that circumstances we live are so unique. I mean, over the broad sweep of history, is this really a unique time? I mean, this is, some people may view this as a broadening of democracy. Some, you said it's an ideological battle. They're ideological battles, deepening of democracy. Are these always bad things? Is change, um, could it be viewed as change? <laughs> I, I mean, I, why is it so special? We, are we, we just are being all, narcissist or? We, we're all, yeah, temporal narcissism yes. is, I believe, the term that now is more important. Yes. Um, look, I don't know. Only time will tell, mm -hmm. you know, whether this, whether this ends so badly special? or well. Um, I think that to have an American president, um, a commander in chief of the, large, of the most powerful, wealthy, and arguably oldest democracy in the world of the caliber of Trump is a profound shock. It's a profound shock to the system. And we, we normalize ourselves to it because it's just so constant, the stream of it's so constant. It is a, a big, big step forward for those around the world who dislike democracy and dislike the ide ideological competition from democracy. For Putin, it's Christmas every day with Trump in the White House. For Xi Jinping, it's uh, Chinese New Year every day. Um, and so I think that um, temporal narcissism is something even at the dullest of times we're all prone to, but it's really very merited right now. Let me just uh, uh, address the same question and say that, no, it's not temporal narcissism. Uh, we are in a bad place. And certainly uh, those of us who actually uh, live here ought to acknowledge whether we are for it or against it, that what we are, what we are seeing uh, over the last five or six years is a reconstitution of the Republic. This is, you know, the French have this habit of signaling shifts in the nature of their republics by numbering them. So you have the First Republic, the Second Republic, the Third Republic. India has been fortunate in the sense that it has had one constitutional republic for a long time. But I think we are informally on the verge of a Second Republic. And I think the reason why your question should be answered categorically is especially your point about the deepening of democracy. Let me say that you could argue that we live in a world where there's enormous information, where there's a lack of gatekeepers, that social media allows us to express our views and spread our views and proselytize for our views. And all of that represents, for good or for bad, uh, a widening at any rate of, uh, of the democratic commons. But let's also acknowledge that the widening or deepening, however you choose to characterize it, has resulted in a series of polities where the cultural and political preferences of religious or racial minorities are central to the functioning of those republics. Now, I'm sure there are many of us here who see this as a good thing, but whether we see it as a good thing or a bad thing, we need to acknowledge that this is happening. We don't have to throw up our hands and clutch our pearls and say that things have never been as bad as this, because for some people, things aren't bad at all, that they might in, in fact represent a form of progress. But as we said in the beginning, for anybody who uh, stands by any notion of liberal principle, however fuzzy, the rise of majoritarian democracies is unequivocally a bad thing. So, so, so then, if you, if you think that it's unequivocally a bad thing, why is it happening now? Uh, well, I think it's been, it's been happening for quite a long time. I mean, we, we tend to take 2016 in the West as shorthand for the beginning of the populist moment, for want of a better phrase, with the election of Trump and, of course, the Brexit referendum. But actually, I think those two events 
came after a long build-up. I mean, I, we were talking about this in an earlier session. Um, the um, median household income in America is about 20% higher today than it was in 1978. But in 1978, the median household had one earner. Today, they've got two. And usually, the woman has two or three, three uh, part-time jobs. And income, so they're working much, much harder. They don't have health benefits, no good pensions. They can't afford to send their kids to college without their kids getting into heavy debt. Um, and they, they, they are suffering from another form of temporal problem, which is exhaustion. There's no time. Um, so they are feeling much, much worse off um, than the numbers would actually suggest. There is a crisis of the middle class. America's ideology is the middle class. It's about equality of opportunity. It uh, might always have been a mythical element to it, but it worked less badly in the post-war decades. It's now broken. You've got, if just a one, one quick data point, um, that there are more people at the Ivy League universities from the top 1%, uh, it's something like 65% of students are from the top 1%, um, than there are in the bottom 90, 90%. Um, that's the, that's the um, ladder to advancement. And it's shut off to all intents and purposes. It's shut off to the middle classes. And that's, that's the American dream. That's the creed. That's the system. I think it's important to say that, you know, our circumstance is very different. It's not as if India has actually experienced some great economic slowdown that has led to the present pass. The opposite, if anything, is true. So I think if we're going to look for explanations about why we are here, um, these are hard explanations to think your way through, but some speculation. First of all, one of the things that uh, the Sangh Parivar and Mr. Modi have done uh, superbly is actually uh, take the trouble of reimagining the nation. There is a sense in which uh, not just Mr. Modi, but, uh, but the Sangh Parivar for 100 years has had a vision of the nation. It has always, in a sense, been the alter ego of, shall we say, the Indian National Congress's notion of the nation. Uh, the, to cut a long story short, uh, Congress nationalism wasn't, in fact, uh, so nationalism as much as a kind of anti-colonial pluralism. And once the, the colonialist went, there was a sense in which a reason for its being left. And the Congress bet was that if we enshrine this pluralism, our democratic values, our liberalism in the constitution, that will carry us forward. But politics doesn't work that way. You can't live off your seed corn. If you don't get up in the morning and push the wheel, the wheel doesn't move. I think what the Sankh Parivar has done for 100 years with extraordinary discipline is push the wheel. Benedict Anderson taught us that nations aren't given. They're actually imagined and reimagined. And the Sankh Parivar has, in fact, reimagined re the nation. They've produced a vocabulary. So, for example, anti-national, pseudo-secular. By what they've done superbly is to invert the vocabulary of liberalism and make it pejorative. The other thing they've done is that they've found, they've either appropriated or they have found what used to be the emblems of a kind of pluralist patriotism and made, made them their own. Whose fault this is, we can, we can argue uh, over an another session. But they have, in fact, worked at imagining a nation. Whereas uh, India's grand old party, the Congress, essentially fed upon the fat accumulated by a great generation of anti-colonial nationalists. So we don't actually have an overarching pan-Indian vision for India. We do, but it's not one that's politically operational. We don't have a vision uh, a kind of liberal vision for a pan-Indian uh, country in the way that uh, the BJP and the Modi have, if you will, a majoritarian vision for, this, for what this country is. If you don't have a vision, you can't mobilize people for it. And essentially, you have this happening at a time when the shibboleths of the early Congress failed in many ways. So, especially the economy failed, especially in the 19, till the 1980s. And people decided that the, that that the three legs that held up the stool, which was economic self-sufficiency, uh, uh, secularism, and non-alignment, because the economy didn't work, the other two had to go by the board. 
So a program exhausted itself and was not renewed. And the program was renewed and enriched. That is why we find ourselves here. So why, why don't you do the work? I mean, it was a wonderful thing you said that you have, the world doesn't move itself. You have to get up and do the work. You have to offer a vision. Clearly, you don't like Modi, but you think he's competent. So why don't we, or at least you implied he's competent. So why don't you do the work? Why don't you hire competent people? Why don't you offer a vision? Not you. Why doesn't that side? Why don't we just, you know, play by rules and, and win, by the, win the game by those rules? What's, you know, wrong, what's wrong with doing work, think, offering vision, hiring competent people, and then convincing people and winning elections, rather than believing that you know, the job of the courts is to protect India from its politicians? The job of you know, counter-majoritarian institutions is to protect India from its politicians. Well, actually, uh, as, uh, as Ed pointed out, uh, one of the functions of a liberal democracy is for a kind of balance between elective and non-elective parts of that democracy. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have liberal democracies. So uh, I don't think the question of whether the Supreme Court, I think the point you make about, uh, uh, about the lack, lack of dynamism and imagination on the part of parties that would like to call themselves pluralist or secular is true. But what is not right in what you say is to throw up your hands and say that the institutions of the republic in the end can't make up for a deficit in, you know, in if you will, uh, popular endorsement is both true and untrue, because if you have uh, a 5-0 unanimous verdict on, uh, on, on, the, on Ayodhya, which basically consists of saying that the site belongs to the Hindus and we give the Muslims uh, five acres elsewhere in Ayodhya, essentially you're offering a deal which Advani would have snapped your arm off if you had get, offered him this in 1989. So, uh, I think both things can be true. This is a court I judgment, think, right? It's not a, it's not, we can say politicians are populist or this is a court judgment. So are we saying that even, even now courts... Are we, so is the, argument, to, is the argument that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the point you're making is that, uh, this uh, is, one of the is it reasonable to dissent from a court judgment because it's a court judgment? No, no, but yes. this was one of the, th so if the court is going 5-0 in some, for, whatever in their wisdom, yes, right? Yes. That we are where we are, life is second at best. I mean, I know you don't like that one, but we are where we are, and the court went with a 5-0 judgment. That's not politics, or it is? Of course it's politics. It is. I politics. mean, there's no institution that is actually free of a political context. Do you want to just close that then? If, if this, we, no, we, we don't have time. I would, do you want to respond to the institutions question? Um, uh, well, you mean this particular ruling? Uh, or no, your, your larger? Just a broader fact that you know, institutions like the courts or other things are supposed to protect a country from its politicians. Sure. Look, if, if tomorrow Trump decides that um, all Hispanic people, whether they're there illegally or illegally, should be kicked out, and he had 85% of the public agreeing with him, he, he should still be stopped. It would be against the law. The law is bigger than any, than any sort of um, moment of politics. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a frame that stops politics from becoming tyranny. And so I go back to the beginning. The majority can be tyrannical. And liberal democracy, the liberal bit, is extremely important. It protects us from ourselves. Well, we're done with that. Thank you.